You know, the sports and advertising world knows something about us. And that is that we admire the success and achievements of our favorite athletes. Oh my God, think about it. We buy their jerseys and we buy their sports uh, paraphernalia and, and we, we have their pictures and their posters around our office. I mean, we love them. Why? Because we borrow their strategies, their determination and their specific skills and translate those into our business model and our everyday practices. I do it. You do it. We all do it. One of mine is, is Tiger Woods. I just think he's an incredible golfer. I was watching that day. Male and female golfers from around the world mobbed that green, cheered as Tiger Woods made his final putt to win the 2019, 2019 Masters Tournament. I mean, it was incredible. It was his fifth time to win the Masters Tournament after almost a 10-year absence. 13 strokes under par. He was the first golfer to bring home a $2.1 million purse. Oh, my God. It was just incredible. He was the undisputed golf champion of the world. I mean, seriously, are there really any other golfers? Let me think. Oh, yeah, really, there are some great ones. Nelly Coda, she's incredible. Jin Young Ko, she's incredible. Uh, Justin Thomas, Roy McIlroy. I mean, I could go on and on. All of these are great golfers, and we borrow things from them and translate them into our strategies and our, perfect, uh, our personal success. So that's what I'm talking about today. So golf is won or lost in four areas, and one of those is from uh, the tee box and with the driver. And so the golfer will hit the ball as long and far as they can down into the fairway. The average golfer hits the ball 245 yards at 91 miles per hour. Oh, my God. Do you think we don't measure that against ourselves? And then once they get into the fairway, they use the irons. The irons are used to navigate through the fairway, around the dog leg, and up towards the green. Once they're on the green, they pull out the putter. And the putter is used to strategically hit that ball so that it measuring the speed of the grass and the contour of the green, it will fall into the hole for a birdie or an under par. Oh my God. It's just exciting and it's incredible. 95% of all golfers spend 95% of their time practicing the driver, the irons and the putter, because those are the three major things that make up golf. But there's a fourth area of golf, and that's the hazards. And the hazards line the fairway and surround the green. It could be the waters or it could be a sand trap. And when a golfer hits their ball and it, it goes sailing through the air and it, it veers off course and lands in the sand, it stalls, it loses its momentum. And now they're in a pickle. 11% of a golf game is played in the hazards. And that's that fourth area. And this is that fourth club. It's called a pitching wedge. You know, golfers spend a lot of time practicing the basics of their game, but they don't spend much time in the pitching wedge. As a matter of fact, I challenge you to go to almost any driving range and see if you can find a sand trap that's at the driving range. Most of them don't have it because people aren't practicing those. Tiger Woods was in the ninth hole in Mexico during the Masters. And standing between, his, his ball was in a sand trap. And between his ball and the hole was a tall tree. Oh, my God. He was trying to figure out what he was going to do. He went to his caddy three times before finally selecting a nine iron. Tiger looked at the ball. He looked at the hole. He looked at the tree. And then he made that incredible swing that lifted that ball over the tree, put a terrific spin on it. It hit the green and rolled 18 inches from the hole. Oh, my God. It was incredible. Well, sand traps. Sand traps are in your business and they're in mind business. 
And they are the things that blindside us, catch us off guard, and we're not expecting them. And, and we're in the middle of a perfect sale or a perfect season, and, and all of a sudden, oh, my God, something veered off, and we're in a sand trap. And it's really important that you and I learn how to conquer those sand traps and practice them. You know, Carla has been in sales for years. And I went to their store to, to help them, the, the rest of their sales team. But Carla was top salesperson again and again and again. Month after month, year after year, Carla is top salesperson. And I'm saying, Carla, how are you doing it? She just laughed and said, you know, Scott, here's the deal. When I got into sales, I, I learned about my product and I learned about all the things that I, I needed to do to close a sale and, and make things happen and, and how to deal with customers. But one of the things that I wasn't good at was overcoming objectives. And man, I started losing sales left and right. And I had to do something about that sand trap. And so I did. I went in and I, I started watching videos. I read books about overcoming objections. I went to conferences. I hired a coach because I wanted to learn how to overcome the objections when people were, when I was making a sale and people were buying from me. And she said it took a lot of practice, a lot of role model, a lot of reading and rewatching videos. But over time, I have become an expert at overcoming sales objections. And as a result, throw me just about anything, I've learned how to overcome that objection. What Carla was saying is that there was a sand trap and she made a conscious decision to become an expert in overcoming that sand trap. Now there's a lot of other sand traps that I could talk about today. Divided priorities is a sand trap. Ghosting customers and clients is a sand trap and paralyzing fear that keeps you from making those big sales. That's a sand trap. But the one I wanna talk about today deals with where we are right now, and that is isolation. Isolation is a mental sand trap. Oh my God, think about it. Isolation is like solitary confinement, and that is a punishment and a torture. I mean, when, when you're in isolation and you're all by yourself, there's, no engagement with your peers or your comrades. There's no stimulating conversation. You know, in, in Castaway, even Tom Hanks had to get a soccer ball and, and, and put some eyes on it and call him Wilson so he'd have somebody to talk to. Isolation is a sand trap. And you may be feeling that way right now. I mean, you're cut off from everybody. You're behind a, a computer right now watching this presentation. You're not out at a conference or with your peers. Isolation can really mess you up because when you're in isolation, you're not able to bounce things off of other people. And unfortunately, it's an amplifier of some things in your life. And that's what COVID-19 has done. It's put a lot of great people in isolation. Hey, I'm an extrovert. I like people. I get my energy from a crowd and from hanging out with people. And when COVID-19 hit and I had to stay at home and I couldn't go to coffee shops and networking events and Top Golf or any of those other places anymore, oh my word, it just about drove me nuts. Well, I had to do something about it. It's just like, you're gonna have to do something about it. So if isolation is a sand trap, then your phone and Zoom are your pitching wedge. And it's something that you can use to get you out of that sand trap. And that's exactly what I did. And I was freaking out. I didn't know what I was going to do. Somebody invited me to a, a Zoom happy hour. And I thought, this is going to be weird. But I got a glass of wine, and I sat in front of a Zoom, and I began to have some discussion with my peers. Before very long, I was invited to a mastermind, a book mastermind. And, man, I got into that. Here's seven or eight other people, and, and we're going to a book together. I started my own book mastermind and invited some of my peers and contemporaries together. And so every Wednesday at three o'clock, man, we'd open up our computers, we'd get on Zoom, heads would start popping in, conversations would erupt, and then we'd get into the book and, and we'd start going over the book. It was incredible, the camaraderie that I began to build in that book mastermind. 
before very long, I had team meetings that I had to attend. I mean, I'm president of the National Speakers Association. All of a sudden, 40 presidents from around the country are in front of me in a, a Zoom meeting, and, and we're talking about uh, our chapters and how things are going and our highs and our lows, and, and I'm feeling encouraged and enthused. Zoom and your phone are your pitching wedge to get out of isolation. Connect with people. You know, I, I put up a, a scheduler that when somebody wants to talk to me, they pick a date that works for them, and they then that sets up a, a Zoom meeting, one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting, puts it on my calendar, puts it on their calendar. Oh, my word. My one-on-one -on -one appointments have tripled during COVID-19. I'm having more conversations and better conversations than I ever had before. You know, at a networking event, I'll be having a conversation with somebody and we're about to, you know, really dive in there and sink the hole and everything's going to go good. Somebody will walk up, distract the whole thing, divert the conversation a different direction. That never happens in Zoom. So I want to encourage you, if you're in that sand trap, and you feel isolated. If it is to be, it's up to me. It's up to you to send out some Zoom invites. Connect with people over your phone and just chat with them. You know, a, a 20 or 30 minute Zoom meeting is plenty. People don't want to spend an hour on a Zoom meeting, but 15, 20, 30 minutes. Yeah, man, let's do that. And you can catch up. Go to some Zoom happy hours. I go to three Zoom happy hours a week. I am in three book masterminds, and I have three team meetings. I don't feel isolated anymore. And some of that, most of that, is because it's things that I initiated. So here's the deal. We practice what our athletes would do, and athletes don't get in isolation. Instead, they get with their team members, they get with their comrades, they get with the other players and they find ways to stay in communication. And if you'll do that, you will pitch out of isolation back into association and hanging out with people. And that energy will come back to you. Hey, listen, my name is Scott Carley. I'm the change energizer. And I energize stalled leaders to focus and take action on their goals their priorities, and income-producing activities. I look forward to spending more time with you again.